welcome to Outrage and Optimism. I'm Tom Rivett Karnak. I'm Christiana Figueres. And I'm Paul Dickinson. This week, we talk about the global effort to protect nature. We speak to actor and oceans activist Ted Danson, and we have music from Jelani Blackman. Thanks for being here. So one of the best times of my week is when I go online and I look at the recent reviews for Outrage and Optimism. And I've got to say, they're generally fantastic. But this week, one cut through to me where someone said, love the optimism, but you guys are a bit short on outrage. So I thought we could maybe start with a little bit of outrage this week. I don't know about you. Oh, my God. Do we have material for that one? (laughs) Oh, what can that be? Let me see. Let me see. What were you all doing last night? What was it? I'm trying to remember. Oh, hang on a second. There was a TV event, wasn't there? Of sorts. So, first of all, did either of you... Because uh, personally, I watched five minutes and it felt like someone was sawing the top of my head off with a hacksaw and spooning out whatever was inside. And I just couldn't bear to watch any more. Were you able to endure it sufficiently to watch some? I did. I did. I oh did. I watched it soup to nuts. <gasps> Christiana, how are you still with us? I know. Come on. Do I... Do do I get all brownie points of everyone on this on this podcast? I don't know what colour they are. You've probably got lots of them. All right, Christiana, go for it. Give us your feedback. Well, you know, honestly, it's difficult to find words. It really is difficult to find words to see uh, the supposed head of the largest economy in the world acting like a one-year-old. It's just beyond description. The, The way that, I mean, bully, irresponsible, disrespectful, he bullied Biden. He bullied the moderator. None of the things that he said make any sense. I mean, it was truly outrageous. Now we know why the title of this podcast is Outrage and Optimism, because that was completely outrageous. If anybody asks me, so give me an example out of outrageous, I'll just send them that link of last night. I, I th- I think, Christiana's finished, for those who, who aren't on Zoom and able to see this, there have actually been like actual flames coming out of Christiana's ears, which is interesting. I've never seen that before. Kind of like a sort of dragon of the mind. Uh, but uh, a, a fierce but justified comment on an outrageous moment in human history. And if I might uh, add my two pennies worth... Um, you know, there was one good thing, maybe climate change was discussed. That was good. But certain behaviours over time have simply cheapened the office of the presidency. You know, th- there are this idea of the dignified and the efficient part of government combined in the US presidency, and it is not looking dignified. People are going to lose trust in the whole enterprise. There was a willful attempt to undermine public confidence in the election process. And this is playing with fire. And I don't know where it's going to end up, but it is pretty unbelievably terrifying. You know, states are supposed to represent something like the best of us, you know, like, like the, you know, monarchies and religions or whatever, they're, they're ways of expressing ourselves. But I mean, look, metaphorically, I think Trump is a kind of undercooked bat. And now a virus has jumped from the reality TV kingdom into the sort of human political kingdom. So we're now forced to keep away, sort of six feet away from us in, 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 in terms of recent discussion. And what's the vaccine? I think that the movement of movements that we're all part of, I think we can kill this virus with, with discussion, with collaboration, and with action. The union makes the force and there's a dignity in action that has to take us back from this precipice of disaster. I mean, and, and just to turn to climate, because I agree, and I, it's, it's, the, it's the undermining of the electoral process that's truly scary, yes. right? You know, that's the piece yes. that is genuinely yes. just that's, that's self-serving. That's where you're messing with You're your messing with something and you're, and, you're, and, you know, endorsing white supremacy. We go on and on, right? I mean, the climate piece in our little world, um, Donald Trump, you know, s- people are making a big deal out of the fact that he said, to a certain extent, I think, yes, when asked about whether climate change was happening. I mean, who cares, right? He's not going to do anything about it. And the trouble with him is he talks in these vapid generalizations about issues that kind of signals to people. I mean, he said, oh, yeah, we're going to have crystal clean water and beautiful air and the lowest carbon. None of it means anything, right? It's just these signaling noises that he puts out while he pursues a completely different agenda and he's prepared to chuck rocks at the entire edifice if it's in his own interests. So let, let's just get over our ranting and then I'm going to say something that attempts to be constructive. Attempts. But first, I think do I know, I think we ranting. better move on. Go for it. Because we're actually going to talk about protecting nature, which is much more exciting on this podcast. So okay. you bring something together. So I'm trying. This morning I woke up and I meditated and I went, 
Right. What can we say and think that is constructive about that? So here is my best attempt at being constructive. It's alchemy. You're taking, yeah, so you're yeah, going to yeah. build something constructive out of this. <laughs> it's a miracle. I, I feel myself in the presence, you know, water into wine. Go for it, Christiana. I'm trying to make gold out of mud. Yeah, isn't that what alchemy is all about? <laughs> right. Um, it is. So it strikes me that there was something quite um, coherent I, I please, I'm using the word coherent in what he said last night about climate. Coherent with him. And that is that when he's asked about climate change, which as we all know, is innately a global issue, his response is in reference to national issues. Yeah. In response mm. to water, air you know, national issues. And I thought that's very interesting. I, I, believe me, meditation is helping. Um, get me to a <laughs> constructive point here. Um, because I thought, well, that's very consistent with who he is and how he thinks. He is fundamentally incapable. Tom, I see a cat. <laughs> A yeah. cat's tail tickling you as we're trying yeah. to a, concentrate a, on the podcast. A very, a very wet cat. I'll see if I can get it to purr into the microphone. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay. <laughs> so as I was trying to be constructive here, um, he is incapable of considering, thinking, understanding, acting on anything global, right? For him, the boundary of the world is the boundary of the United States, sometimes even not the full United States. In fact, only the pieces of the United States that he wants and that he likes. Um, so there is an, an incomplete United States is, and certainly an incomplete United States citizens map, is the boundary of his understanding, his engagement. And... So I thought that's interesting. He is being consistent with that because when asked about something that is global, he goes back to local air quality, local yeah. water quality. I want, and I thought, well, maybe we just have to accept that that's the boundary of his understanding and he will never be able to embrace anything that is global, either a global threat or global solutions or multilateralism. All of that is anathema to him, all of it. And so that is my best attempt at being productive and constructive. What do you think about that? I mean, just to agree with you, Christiane, what he said is if you look at the Paris Accord, it was a disaster from our standpoint. That is to say that, yeah, he is only capable, as you said, of looking through this little letterbox uh, of, of his, uh, his, his selfish position. No, I, I agree with that. The, the other thing I would add to it, though, and a different in interpretation of what you just said, Christiana, is that climate is actually his most vulnerable issue because he's got no answer. He doesn't understand it enough. He, I mean, he didn't interrupt as much when climate was being discussed. I understand. I couldn't sit through the debate um, because he kind of didn't know what to say, right? He doesn't have any answer to that. So, but... As, you know, Americans do, sorry, people from the United States do, like the US. <laughs> Listeners, this is a PSA. America is two continents. <laughs> and for many years, I've been getting in trouble. Yeah. Christiana's applauding me. Namaste. Yeah. Anyway, he is unable to explain a leadership position of the United States on the global stage because he doesn't understand kind of what that means and how you play that diplomatic statement. On any role. issue. On, that on is so issue. true, Tom, on any issue. Climate, yeah. human rights, nothing. He yeah. is completely incapable of acting, thinking, or, you know, analyzing anything on a global, on on a, a global, on a level. global stage. But, it is, his, but, his brain gets to, you know, the boundary of some states and some people in the United States, and that's where it drops off into a precipice. Yeah. Now, I'm not a pollster, right, but my understanding is that actually – you know, people from the U.S. do actually like the way that the U.S. plays a global leadership role, the role that they have in the world. And so, therefore, that kind of myopic focus on these different issues and that inability to have that statesmanlike role, I would suggest, is a vulnerable issue for him in the election. And God, I hope I'm right. Well, and the tragedy is that, A, you have to understand the global scenario, the global stage, but 
it is so suicidal to take his position because what he is doing is he is stopping the potential of the U.S. economy to benefit yeah. from action on climate change. That is what is so tragic. Totally, if absolutely. they open themselves up to climate action and then, you know, I don't know, then it would be a huge financial punishment, economic disaster. Okay, then, you know, any president should protect himself against that. But that's not the case. The case is quite the opposite. Climate action has been proven over and over and over again to actually benefit and strengthen national economies. So that's the tragedy there. Yeah. You know, the other thing that benefits national economies? Protecting your natural environment. That's very clear yes, as well. Yes, indeed. Ooh. Yeah. Are we pivoting? Are we pivoting? <laughs> now, something else happened, and there are reasons for outrage and optimism caught within this. The Leaders' Pledge for Nature came out this week. It was launched on Monday ahead of the major UN summit on biodiversity, which is being hosted in New York right now. And that summit is working towards a kind of Paris-style global agreement on nature. Um, there's actually now 69 leaders who've signed, some very significant leaders, including the US and a range of others that we'll get into, didn't sign. But I know you guys probably have strong views about this. So who wants to kick off with what happened? Okay, so I, I actually got outraged by one thing here, and that is that it was not on the front page of every yeah. newspaper, every news website, in every TV program. I mean, just hold on, friends, here for a minute. 64, as you said, uh, now more leaders uh, sign this pledge. I mean, I'm just going to mention five countries uh, where the heads of state wrote, uh, signed the letter. EU, Mexico, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Kenya. Just those five countries is a billion people. And there were 69 of them. All right. Now, what did they say? Uh, you know, when Emmanuel Macron and Angela Merkel and Justin Trudeau and the world's coolest Jacinda Ardern all signed, what were they saying? They were saying, we, political leaders participating, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, affirm our commitment to international co collaboration and multilateralism, the exact reverse of what we were seeing in that idiotic debate. Uh, well, from, from one of them anyway. Um, and they say, this is, this is like the leaders of the world saying, we are in a state of planetary emergency, okay? And I could go on, but, but just, just to summarize here, read the statement and whatever you're doing, wherever you're working in the world, you now have, you know, about a third of the world's population, about a third of the world's economy behind you. Take these leaders at their words and use it to kick down whatever doors you need to make change. Thank you. But now, um, here's, here's my obnoxious question. Okay, that the United States wouldn't sign. Okay. But... We do have 195 countries. Minus the United States is 194. Where is everybody else? Well, it's a very good question. And, and the list of countries that sat it out is significant, right? Leaders of Australia, Brazil, China, Russia, and India all refused to sign the pledge. So actually, you can look at this as just a, a coalition of the usual suspects plus some other countries that have been sort of pushed into it through development budgets, whereas many of those critical countries, I mean, the absence of Brazil is terrible. But what I wonder, Cristiano, is I remember a year before Paris, the US-China agreement really paved the way for the Paris agreement a year later. And I think what these leaders are kind of hoping is that this declaration will pave the way to a very significant agreement at the Biodiversity Summit in Kunming next year. What do you think about that? Yes, no, definitely. Definitely that's that is the hope and and I guess, you know, if if you understand the way communications and messaging works, um it works on a drum beat, right? There's one drum beat and then the next and the next. Right. And so this is definitely uh let's call it the starting point, although so many people have been working on this for years. But um but it is definitely a success. It's just an insufficient success. Um, so it is a process that needs to be continuously strengthened from here to the also delayed biodiversity convention of next year. Now, one, you know, to move to optimism, one, I forced Hooray! myself there. <laughs> Yay. Yay! One interesting thing that, uh, you know, I was always against the delay of all of these international meetings this year. But 
had we had the biodiversity meeting, maybe we only would have had 60, 60 something countries mm. agree to the 30 by 30 target, mm. right? Because yeah. that's where we are right now. And so on the bright side of things, let's say, okay, this is a very good starting point in September of 2020. We still have the better part of a year to continue to work with other countries in order to at least do duplicate that number of countries that come along. Um, and, uh, and the other thing, Tom, with your comparison is that, yes, the collaboration between the United States and China was very, very important to deliver the Paris Agreement, and they did sign three bilateral, no, four, four bilateral agreements before Paris. Right. What was absolutely critical about that is that it was the largest developed economy and the largest developing country economy. Yeah. And unless you have the two bulls charging the force, then it's difficult for other countries to fall in line. At this point, this is, I would call it very much of a bottom up approach where politically we're gathering all the, uh, the like-minded countries on this, but it would make a huge difference if you had some of the large India, China, um, of the largest developing countries coming on board. And hopefully early next year, after January, the largest developed country um, economy. Because it does make a difference. The UN is one country, one voice, one vote. And, and that's a very firm value and principle that all of us respect and worked with very diligently, but it does make a difference where the biggies are. Now, now we should just say, I completely agree with that. And then we should just say we're recording this on Wednesday evening. And some people have been speculating that Xi Jinping will come to the biodiversity summit that's currently happening and bring a big nature announcement like he did the big climate announcement. So you know that, listener. We don't. Ooh, it's possible that that's already happened by the time you're listening to this podcast. <laughs> well, I mean, he's making a bit of a reputation for himself, you know, net zero by 2060 or no, earlier. Before but, I mean, look at that 2060. club. Before 2060. Thank you for correcting me. Um, but look at this club. You know, it, it, this letter was signed by Ursula von, von der Leyen, the, the head of the sort of largest economic unit in the world. This club, you know, gives political cover to anyone that wants to join. You've got to be crazy not to join this club. And by the way, Tom, I'm, I think it was a little cynical to, for you to talk about aid budgets. The 163 million people in Bangladesh know all Try. about climate change. The 217 million people in Pakistan know all about climate change. And what do they say? What does this statement say? What do all those political forces say? This acceleration of the damage they're talking about is causing irreversible harm to our life support systems and aggravating poverty and inequalities as well as hunger and malnutrition. They couldn't be more clear. This is a turning point, but it probably will only be a turning point if everyone listening to this show makes it yeah. into one. No, you're fair enough. Fair, fair, fair point. But I also think Christiana's point is true because if you listen to that list of non-signers, I mean, you know, United States, Brazil, China, Russia, India, you know, that, that's a big deal, right? That those major economies are not, I mean, Australia, my God, Scott Morrison refused yet. to Let's sign. Say yet, Yet, right. And Scott Morrison refused to sign because he said that the commitments are inconsistent with Australian policy, including the ambition to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050. This is the prime minister that just watched his country burn nine months ago. And now he exactly. refuses to sign up to this. It's insane. But one powerful part of this was the commitment, it's not only on land, it's also to halt unsustainable fishing practices, among much else. And that leads us to today's conversation with the amazing Ted Danson. Are we ready to pivot to that? Well, I just, just before we pivot, I would like to know, do we have a sense that we have been outraged enough? Because we have been told we're not outraged enough. So have we today been outraged enough? What do I, you think? I think we've dialed it up, but that listener who provided that review, please let us know. Yes, good point. I, I, you yeah. know, I, In fact, uh, any listeners. The, 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 <laughs> any listeners. Yeah, for those, we need, to, we need to go on to TV because uh, Christiana, you know, has this way of raising one eyebrow and then another, but I definitely saw true outrage coming <laughs> forward uh, alongside Christiana's crystal clear words and uh, immaculate vision was this sort of intensity, which I guess we all feel in our hearts about the craziness in certain places where people should be a lot more grown up because they're 
economy is just too big to so muck Paul, about I'm with. just wondering if we can have a grading system on our episodes. They're either a no eyebrow, a one eyebrow, or a two eyebrow episode. And so we, <laughs> we can... Well, this is a full on two. This is a full on two. Full on two. Big V. Right, Big V. Yeah. <laughs> this is a two eyebrow episode, people. Okay, now we are so excited to bring you this interview that we did a couple of weeks ago with Ted Danson. So Ted Danson, of course, is an actor from the United States and a producer who achieved early fame playing the lead character Sam Malone in the United Statesian sitcom Cheers. Um, he's since gone on to star in many successful TV films, including Curb Your Enthusiasm, Bored to Death, The Good Place. He's received countless accolades and awards during his lifetime, including two Emmys and three Golden Globes. Now, aside from his acting career, he has been a lifelong environmental activist and a leading spokesman on international ocean issues in particular. He co-founded the American Oceans Campaign in 1987, which grew into Oceana, the largest organisation in the world focused solely on ocean conservation. And he's still a board member. In 2011, he published his first book, Oceana, Our Endangered Oceans and What We Can Do to Save Them. We absolutely loved this conversation. It was such a privilege to talk to Ted. We really hope you enjoy it and we'll be back afterwards with more comment. Ted, thank you so much for joining us on Outrage and Optimism. We, we would love to invite you to kick us off with a story because just before we started recording, you were remembering uh, your time with Jane Fonda, with whom you got arrested recently. And you mentioned that uh, she has really marked your life, which is where we are now. But we would love to invite you to go way back uh, and 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 give us a, a a little inkling of where did this environmental passion start? You, you we have someone else on uh, on the podcast whose family has been devoted to the oceans for generations. That is not your case at all. You were born in Arizona. You were, grew up basically on the desert, riding horses with. First Nation friends. Um, How is that what got you into environmental awareness and passion? Or where where did this all come from? It's just bigger than life, your passion on environment and especially on oceans um, that are a little bit far away from Flagstaff, Arizona. So how did that all happen? Uh, Let me me start with my parents. My father was an archaeologist and an anthropologist. Uh, He fell in love with the Southwest and really almost never left. He uh, taught at the university and then in Tucson and then moved to Flagstaff in the 50s to to become the director, assistant director, then the director of the Museum of Northern Arizona and the Research Center. And uh, this was an amazing place because you go from 13,000 feet above treeline, the San Francisco Peaks, and theor- you know, for all intents and purposes, you, in an hour and a half, you can be at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So geologically, anthropologically, the different uh, tribes that live in that area, the, the cliff dwellers, you know, you can go back uh, if, within, uh, if you're an anthropologist, an archeologist, if you're a paleontologist, it didn't matter. You were, this was a dream little uh, museum and research center that attracted people and scientists from all over the world. So uh, I was raised, uh, you know, uh, around the dining table pretty much every day of the week in the summer. Uh, we had visiting scientists sitting around. Uh, none of that sunk in because I was busy playing <laughs> yes, with my. Yes, it did. Uh, <laughs> yes, it much, did. Much no, to the well, disappointment well, you know of your what? parents or what? <laughs> <laughs> it. it um, well, that's my right. father. Let me then jump over to my mother, who uh, uh, raised us. She was, uh, you could say, a housewife, and yet she was the one who hosted all of these scientists from all over the world, you know, for the major part of her life. So she uh, was a very hardworking, uh, you know, housewife mother. Uh, but she, uh, um, spiritual is a word that gets thrown around uh, a lot. She was a, an Episcopalian, a churchgoer, later became a, a Catholic, and and then even later after that, I think she moved into this really amazing spiritual place. And to me, that is kind of the foundation of 
um, of my, those are the two pillars for yeah, me of how you approach pillars. the environment. Yeah, two amazing pillars. Yes, you, you have to have science to lead the way because uh, you, you want to get it right. Mm. You know, you want to base it on facts and you need the spirituality uh, that brings your heart and the realization that we are all in this together and that we are indeed our brother's keepers and uh, we're all going to make it or none of us are going to make it. So it's it was kind of a perfect thing that meanwhile, I'm sitting there riding horses with my Hopi friends and my Navajo friends and ranchers' sons and daughters and paying attention to nothing. <laughs> um, and... <laughs> Well, except exposed, you were exposed to different oh, yes. culture. No, no, it was amazing. I mean, I would literally be with my friend Raymond uh, <clears throat> up in the Hopi mesas, uh, you know, running around the plazas where, uh, you know, they would, uh, their dances were praying to their gods uh, the same way, in the same place, on the same, you know, packed earth uh, for over 500 years. Wow. And we may have been playing, but that's... And then I would go to church on Sunday. So I, you know, I also got exposed to, there are many ways to, to pray uh, to your God, to God. And, uh, many, many paths, one truth. Yes, yes, thank you. Much better. Um, so that, that was me. And then I went off, and, and clearly not the student. I, you know, so off I went to Kent School for Boys in Connecticut, and then I went to Stanford because... Uh, I so didn't really care about academics. It turns out that I tested really well because I found it amusing and fun. <laughs> so I ended up at Stanford and then I found acting and then I, I'm rushing through this part. Then I went to LA, I got cheers and about three or four years later, they were paying me more money than they should have. And I started to think, wow, I better be responsible about this. And then I met a man named Robert Sulnick who was an environmental lawyer. And we, uh, together, uh, along with a group of people, uh, stopped Occidental Petroleum from dr slant drilling into Santa Monica Bay. Mm. And uh, we were fascinated by our, our, the conversation and, our, um, and the relationship we had. So we started something called American Oceans Campaign. So can I ask years. a little, a little yes. question there? You, you yes. said you liked it. You, you said you liked each other's company, right? Yeah. But I mean, I met you. I bet you've met lots of people whose company you like. But it seems there's something about combining friendship with action. Is that is that fair? Or I just yes, love that 100%. story. Yes, hundred percent. I am. I've never been that guy that goes, "Hey, let's go have a beer and uh, catch up." You know, I, I, I'm married, and if it's not my wife, Mary. I'm not that interested unless it's around a project. Then yeah. I can't wait to hang out with you and figure something out. You know, yeah. that's kind of if if it's a roll up our sleeves uh, chat yes. and over a beer, that's fine. Yes. But not just over a beer Correct. doing nothing. Correct. Okay, I love Correct. it. Um, Good. And, We're all birds yeah. of a feather here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, to answer your question, why I'm guessing first two things. It's the most fascinating conversation to me oceans mm. you can talk about everything you know uh you can talk about feeding the world which we can talk about later because it is a perfect protein fish you know you can talk about uh uh oil and energy uh you can talk about and have to talk about climate change you can talk about spirituality because we all are going to have to do this and get over our you know, aren't I the most amazing individual and it's my way or the highway <laughs> kind of thinking. So to me, it's the most interesting conversation to have. Um, and, and then I think on a kind of a psychological level, part of me is going, hey, daddy, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm an actor. Yes. Uh, you know, I'm sitting at the kids table. Yes. But I but I'm hanging around a lot of scientists, <laughs> you know. I've always, and doing a lot of good. Yeah. I've always been the guy who uh, said to people coming up to me, thank you so much for watching Cheers. Now I'd like to introduce you to this marine biologist. She has this amazing thing to tell you. <laughs> you know, and that is my purpose. I love that. I love that. <laughs> yeah. So here I, I am. I love that. So Ted, that, that's fascinating because what I, um, what I conclude from that is that you figured out that the oceans are an organizing principle 
for you and Whoa. for everything that you care about, right? Yeah. Organizing it's an organizing principle. principle. That's yeah. big. That's well, huge. Isn't it? Because, be, because you're saying, you know, it's about food. It's about um, pollution or hopefully uh, less pollution. It's about drilling. It's about energy. It's about temperature rise. It's coral reefs. I mean, it is just so many things. And so you use the oceans to communicate um, all the, the relationship between all of these different human endeavors and natural ecosystems, and they all belong together. Yes. And it really is. It's really a mirror uh, you can look at the oceans and you can see how we're doing on land. You can see everything we've done uh, and aren't doing. Uh, so, yeah. Now, I think of all the nations, you know, all these little lines on the map. And, and we we were talking to this wonderful astronaut, uh, Jessica Mayer, and she was saying, like, you you know, from space, you just, the nations aren't there. And then she also said, and the ocean is everywhere and it's one ocean. Yeah. I mean, our job, I think, as people who love the environment and uh talking about climate change and oceans and all of that. You know, uh, you always bump into how can people not believe in this? How can people not believe the science and all of that? So I always, I think it's healthier to say, okay, what are we not doing right in our communications? Mm. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's some people beyond reach, but, um, you know, what are we not doing right? And so I always, besides all of the stuff that we were talking about that has most the scientific and spiritual bent to this. I could make an argument about this whole conversation from a from your pocketbooks point of view. Yeah, you know, from mm-hmm. from a financial jobs point of view. Um, you know, I can talk about it. We can talk about it from a social justice point of view. Yeah. You know, so everything you want to do to make the, uh, America better. Do the right thing for the oceans, and you damn near will have to have had to address all of those issues. So, um, well, l- let me ask a specific question about uh, Oceana, if I may. I mean, there's a fantastic story about forming, you know, the the leading uh, kind of non governmental organization, or I don't think we've ever found the right name for the plural sector or the third sector. But Oceana has been so effective over such a long time, and. Um, I even heard you talking about over your your journey, like not throwing bricks, but becoming friends with oil company executives or whatever, and and trying to find that middle ground. With your incredible experience, can I ask you what do you think has been the the the, the way Oceana has made the the greatest interventions, and what lessons there are for the thousands of activists that that are listening to the show uh, about how you can make change in the world? What are you really proud of having achieved with Oceana? Um, I hope I'm going to answer this, by, by, but I will probably ramble a little bit. Oceana was started with Pew Foundation money, and they set, set up uh, international foundations all over the world to participate so that, you know, there was a $14 million budget kind of right off the bat. Mm. And uh, because the thought was... Not a bad start. No, Not no, a no. bad start. And the, but the reason was... You're, you're going to make many NGOs very jealous about that little piece <laughs> I know, of information. I know. <laughs> um, no, it was earned. It was earned. But please, yeah, sorry, Ted, carry and, on. <laughs> but the point was, we're not, we're not going to be able to come be a membership organization which takes so much time to set up yeah. and costs so much to bring back that dollar. You have to spend so many dollars that the, the crises facing the ocean are so urgent that that was the thought behind jump-starting it with that kind of money. And we've moved past that and beyond that. We no longer have the Pew money. But um, uh, So anyway, they, they looked at what the state of the oceans. They did a state of the oceans study for many years. And, and they looked at that list of the most pressing things. And then they looked at they, what they felt, I should say, we f- felt, because uh, I joined early on, um, we felt we could make a difference. Hmm. We didn't want to just educate and take a swing at things or jump up and down or throw bricks. We wanted to change policy to put more, well, it turned out to put more fish in the ocean because the most pressing thing it turned out was overfishing. Uh, there was a study by uh, Daniel Pauley from the British, uh, uh, British Columbia, University of British Columbia, that mid 80s, 87, 
fisheries around the world were starting to decline. More mm -hmm. and more boats going out with more and more sophisticated equipment that could, you know, point to that fish over there. And yet they were coming back with fewer and fewer fish. We were literally overfishing our oceans. And th over the years, we have we found out why and had programs addressing that. Uh, but it was all based on putting more fish in the ocean. And you then have to do all of the things that you would have to do just to preserve biodiversity, you have to do to put more fish in the ocean. Um, and you have to approach it from all these different ways. But that was the organizing principle for Oceana was change policy. Do not, uh, we will have three or four or five or six campaigns that deal with oceans, that deal with putting more fish in the ocean. We're not gonna scoot over here and take, the, we're not gonna be opportunistic. We are gonna focus on what we think we can do to make a difference. Um, and then that led over the years to realizing everything that we were doing we really was talking about save the oceans, feed the world. Mm -hmm. If you do those three things, stop destroying habitat, uh, stop uh, uh, you know, overfishing to the point where, and wasteful fishing where you, you, know, you throw overboard dead or dying one third of the world catch because it's not your fish or it's too small or, it's, or the nets are so indiscriminate. Uh, and if you use science to set the quota for how many fish you can take out and still be viable, then you could, if you can uh, qu quantify fish this way, you could provide a billion fish meals a day sustainably to the world. So now you're talking about saving the oceans and feeding the world. And all of a sudden, when we did that, money started to pour in from people like Bloomberg uh, Philanthropies, because that feeding the world is a much uh, more of an eye-catching yeah. statement than saving fish. You know, <laughs> you talk about saving fish, I can put people to sleep in about five minutes. <laughs> you should, you anyway. should hear us talk about greenhouse gas emissions. That's quite good as well at doing that. Yeah, that's right. yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> when we get into numbers. Um, Ted, I can totally see that policy changes are really critical to uh, reducing or eliminating overfishing. That link is very evident to me. Now, these days, overfishing is as um, important in people's attention as plastic in the oceans, or differently said, plastics in the oceans has risen yes. as a topic yes. of attention uh, qu quite precipitously. Um, I would love to hear you explain, if you believe, and if not, whichever way, that policy changes can be equally effective with ocean plastics um, as they are with overfishing, are they? Yes, yes, I, I, we believe that. Um, I mean, talking to, for us, for me, talking about plastics then uh, comes under the, the category of climate change, you know, uh, greenhouse gases, it comes under uh, petroleum products and so it's kind of the same conversation, but let's just th talk about plastics for a minute because, um, yeah, I mean, we all see the pictures and it's sad and fear, you know, there's so much plastic in the oceans now. And uh, we also see the pictures of uh, birds and, uh, and sea mammals being strangled by yeah. fishing, plastic fishing gear and other plastic. And so you, you see the stomachs of birds that are just full of yeah. undigestible plastic. Yeah. And a lot of critters in the ocean do that. It looks like a jellyfish. It looks like a something small that they can eat. So then their stomachs fill up with it and then they starve to death because they are full, but full of plastic. Um, so there are all these emotional things about plastics that get people's attention. But then there's also what, you know, from the fracking and drilling and producing the oil that makes the plastic, that goes into making the plastic. And then the, uh, how do you dispose of it, the plastic, when you want to recycle it or get rid of it. Uh, that life cycle of plastic is a huge contributor to climate change, to greenhouse gases. And the reason why we talk about that from an ocean-only organization is climate change 
has the ability to come and undo literally all the work mm. that we're doing. Climate change, you know, is warming the waters. So coral reefs are dying. Fish that are local in your area that have been plentiful are, you know, swimming, following the cold water north and are no longer, you know, they're in Canada now, not in your backyard. Yeah. Uh, acidification, which comes from the oceans not being able to absorb any more carbon uh, without changing the pH balance, which means the little critters can't make the shells that allow them to be the bottom of the food chain. All of that. So plastic is a huge subject for the oceans. And it's kind of tied in, from in my mind, to part of the climate change. Mm. So what we've done, one of the campaigns that we have is to reduce single-use plastic, to do away with that. I mean, when you think about bottles that are, water bottles that are used, and soda bottles that are used for single use, they make, they make a product that will last literally forever in one yeah. form or another. It will last forever, and it's to be used just once. So that doesn't make sense. So... You know, you, you go after the corporations, the companies that are making them, but you also go to the public and you say, hey, you know, because the, the, the corporations say, we have recycling. Plastic companies say, we have recycling. You all are just not recycling well enough. But the truth is 9% of all the plastics ever been in the oceans, you know, are, have been recycled, 9%, you know. So it's, it, it doesn't really complete, it doesn't work. Yeah. It doesn't mean stop recycling, but it does not work. And, you know, we know for a fact that oil companies are telling their stockholders, I know we're going to lose money on transportation, but don't worry, plastic is up and running. And they're going to build nine new plastic company factories, huge ones all over the world. And, you know, it's supposed to quadruple by 2050. So... This is a huge problem. So anyway, back to public, you know, here's what people can do and what they deserve. Give us a plastic free option. Hmm. When I walk into a store, you know, I should be able to say, actually, I don't want any plastic. Or Amazon, please don't use plastic in shipping me what I need during this day of COVID. Hmm. You know, they need to give us options because when you, when you do a survey, which Oceana did to Amazon customers, 86% of them are worried about the amount of plastic and want to be able to have that uh, plastic-free choice. Wow. So it's, it's about trying to change minds, uh, and it's going to be big. It's, all these problems are huge, but, you know, <laughs> but, but we have to. Yeah. We literally have to, and that's one way. And that, Sorry. No, 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 that's, that's so interesting. And, and that piece about changing minds is, is I think, so fascinating because you're right, there has to be a policy solution to all of these different challenges, and we have to push for that. We need to find the pathway to it. But the piece that we've never really cracked, I think, in climate change, and I think this might be true for oceans as well, is, you know, the, the, the historical abuses that we have visited upon our world are the outcome of our cultural assumptions and our norms around our role in the world, right? And you can make historical arguments for what that looks like and, and why that might be the case. And we now need to make a kind of cultural transformation about how we see the world and our role in it that might be realistically expected to take a couple of generations and we've got to do it in 10 years. So that, that transformation is quite exciting and quite overwhelming. And it feels now, particularly in this age of COVID, that we've moved into a phase where everything's changing and everything's possible. So it could reform in this positive way and it could also sort of start to fall apart really quickly. Well, yeah, I mean, politics, um, who knows? You know, people's, uh, uh, we're all, you know, full of human foibles, including selfishness and greed. Yeah. We're all, you know, we're a mixed bag. Can we evolve it? Can we evolve in time? Yeah. You know, and yeah. can politics gather around and can we, you know, be smart and think about science? Can, all of that is, is up for grabs. But here's what's not up for grabs. Yeah. A virus. Right. That's shut down the world. Right. Shut it down. Yeah. And that has, that is... You know, I don't know that I can prove it, but you do know that it's connected to climate change. Yeah. You do know that this more of this is coming our way yeah. because everything is moving 
towards the equator or north, you know, things that we haven't dealt with before because of climate change is going to come into our, you know, sphere. Uh, the, the climate change is not going away. We can argue, we can shake fists, mm. you know, but, you know, this is coming our way. I think that hopefully we will have, will have you know, learned our lessons that, and uh, one more thing, you know, sorry for using, you know, quick words to, to, or phrases to explain what I'm thinking, but Black Lives Matter yeah. is not going away. Social injustice, racial injustice, systemic racism is not going away. Mm. It has reached that point. COVID is not going away unless we, you know, do those smart things. Climate change is not going away unless we start doing these drastic makeovers on society. Mm. The good news is if you get people's attention, you are going to create jobs. You are going to do all these things that are better for all of us, mm. you know. And how it's tricky. I mean, it, in that it's really yeah. interesting. I mean, you know, Black Lives Matter is fascinating. You know, I mean, Colin Kaepernick was taking a knee, all these other things were happening. It it kind of was a bit on the fringe and people were criticizing it. Then all of a sudden it's everywhere, obviously as a result of a of an outrage that happened in Minneapolis. But how, I mean, there's relatively few people like you who have been in the public eye for decades and have always had this concern about these broader issues around environment and you've sort of made that part of your public persona and you've pushed for it consistently. Um, but, but from where we're sitting, it feels like that's a really important part of culture change is people who shape our culture in this sort of celebrity-focused world that we're in you know, people like you and the career you've had over many years and so many other people shape what so many people think, but relatively few people choose to use that platform in a consistent, dedicated way for change. Why not? And how can we persuade more of them to do it? I think you'd be surprised. I Ready? bet you there yeah. are more people than we, uh, even I realize. Mm. I think there are more people out there doing this. Uh, um, I mean, l look at a uh, fire drill Friday, you know, People showed up out of the woodwork to be with Jane. Hmm. Uh, uh, Greta, you know, obviously Thunberg is, is has motivated people. Um, um, I, I, you know what? Here's, you know, we're da I'm dancing around this. You know, what we need to do is 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 elect a new administration, yeah. because right yeah. now we have people who are literally uh, denying that science and you know climate science is real. And a lot of them know better, but they are willing to, yeah, you know. They do. Say, yeah, they do. The, yeah. A lot of the Republican senators went to Harvard, Yale, Princeton. They, they, they studied. Know. They know what's real. Yeah. But, you know, it is, well, there's oil. There's oil money. There's the, oh, a whole bunch of kind of toxic mixture of stuff that makes people want to deny it. But. We do need to switch out the administration and let science have its day again. But I do think people will listen a little bit more because science is saving their lives now in hospitals. You know, yeah. I, I think, you know, um, you know, you, 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 you're, we, we're losing jobs all over the place. Well, guess what? If we do the right thing, and as much as like the Green New Deal scares the crap out of half the world or something, <laughs> it is it is not a bad not blueprint. Us. Yeah, not us. We we it, like it. Yeah, it's a blueprint on, and you know, people who don't want it because it threatens their uh, their way of of making money, oil companies and people who are hooked into oil companies, you know, will fight it. But the truth is. You're going to create more jobs, places, you know, the inner city will be better because you will make sure that energy, dirty energy is not getting dumped on their laps as always. You can make sure the jobs go to those parts of the world, you know, including, the, you know, the Rust Belt and including, uh, you know, West Virginia, you know. Yeah. You, you Anyway. Uh, boy, I'm. Uh, I, I, I well, haven't had Ted, coffee for like, Ted, like twelve Ted, hours. Good, more coffee, more coffee. Wow, 
Wow, if 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 that was all on no coffee, now can you imagine with some coffee? Jeez. Well, Ted, um, in just in the last few minutes, you've gone through an amazing array of issues um, that make you angry and outraged, uh, and an amazing array of issues and facts um, for which we can be grateful and quite excited. And that that's basically the reality, right? Uh, that's why our podcast is called Outrage and Optimism because we feel. We should and we are still intensely outraged about many things that haven't happened yet. And we're optimistic about how much is happening and how much more can happen. So um, at the end of every conversation, we ask our guests to um, place themselves in this spectrum Where are you as such a long-term activist with all the changes that you've already seen, um, but being fully aware of how much more we have to do? Are you more on the outrage side? Are you on the optimist side? And you can choose to answer that question either for the November timeline or beyond. Well, first, let me confess that I think I'm squelching my outrage because um, I'm 72. Uh, we're quarantined in our house. Um, I don't know that I want to jump on the ramparts again. I, you know, and I look at my friend Jane, and she, I'm embarrassed. Um, so I'm probably more <laughs> outraged than I than I'm letting on. Hmm. Um, but here's how I feel about outrage. I think yes, but quickly, yes, absolutely. Within a healthy uh, for your body. Uh, space of time, be outraged, but then switch gears immediately. Because if you stay in outrage, it's, that's right next door to fear, you know, and, it, and, uh, it's, uh, and, uh-huh. it's, and it's fear that nothing will get done. So it's outrage, if it leads that way, is immobilizing. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, I think it's great to be critical, but n- no longer do we have the right to be cynical. Mm. You know, we need to... Oh, what an important difference. Yeah. Yeah. What an important difference. Wow. You know, it's like science. uh, I mean, there's there's room for pure science, but now it's like everything needs to be applied. We need the smartest uh, people, the the best knowledge, the best inventions and things to come to to focus on this. Um, Here's the optimistic part. (laughs) <laughs> okay, we're but ready. This, all right, this is a bit of a cliche now coming out of my mouth because I say it so often. All right. And my wife, Mary, goes, no, you got to stop saying that. Here's what makes me when I'm... Uh, we won't tell her that you said <laughs> it again. Uh, and, and you don't say it to kids in the room. But um, at 72, I can say this. Um, and then you die. So what are you waiting for? Who cares? Get up. Do a Jane Fonda, strap on your boots, and do the best you can, because it's not like you're going to get this uh, You Saved the Oceans Award. Ooh, here's your immortality card. (laughs) You know, you you are just like everyone else, Ted. And, uh, and, you know, this all has, this gift of life is just here, this part. I don't know what happens afterwards. So go for it. Mm. You know, why not? Odds are you're going to feel better. Totally. You know, you're going to have fun talking to people. Anyway, so yes, I'm optimistic. Um, uh, I'm optimistic that that kids are going to vote. I'm optimistic that, uh, you know, the people in the street, um, uh, I'm hopeful that they will continue to protest and the violence will go away because that's counterproductive. Uh, I'm hopeful that people are listening to Greta and the Gretas of the world are going, wait, this is our world. Um, yep, it is I, theirs. I'm hopeful that technology, can I just do a quick technology yeah. thing? Um, so, you know, you do all these wonderful things, policies and rules and regulations for the ocean to make it better. Then how the heck do you, you know, if you're a small country, do you regulate that? How do you tell China to bug off and don't come in our water? Whatever it is, how do you uh, police that? So Oceana, uh, a satellite company whose name I'm blanking on, I think it's called Sky Truth, and Google got together to create Global Fishing Watch, which allows you, if you go to Global Fishing Watch, you can, anybody, it's for free, 
uh, go on and you can see in near real time, which I means I think means about 12 hours now, or uh, the, the name and placement of every ship on the water over 300 tons. And that number is going down. It'll be smaller and smaller vessels. So you can see when a vessel enters your water and starts to you know, zigzag around instead of steaming right through it, because that means they're fishing in your waters. You know, you can start to see and police and meet them at the dock or go to the insurance companies and say, hey, you're insuring a, a, a vessel that does all this illegal I stuff. I love it. Yeah, so I have hope in technology as well. I think technology will help totally. us as well. Totally, but we're also technology enthusiasts, among other things. Well, Ted, thank you so much. Thank you for taking um, so much time with us today. And now I'm sorry to say that it is our time to do a cliche thing. And so instead of saying goodbye and thank you, we're going to say cheers. To you. <laughs> cheers. Cheers to all of you. I can't tell you how much fun it was to spend this half hour with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Loved it. Yes, yeah. seriously. Yeah, Thanks loved very it too. much. Bye bye. 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 That was so amazing to get a chance to sit down with Ted Danson. What a, what a legend. What did you guys leave that conversation with? You know, just at the very beginning when he was speaking about his childhood, I, I was really taken by um, how in his childhood through his father, he was exposed to science, although he says it didn't penetrate him. Um, he was exposed to spirituality through his mother, although he says he didn't pay any attention to it, um, and then through his own friends exposed to um, indigenous and Aboriginal wisdom. And I thought, you know, how, what a fantastic childhood to have had because commonly we think of science, spirituality, and indigenous wisdom as sort of being in very different spaces and mutually exclusive of each other. Um, and they're not, right? And the fact that he draws from all three of them now in his adulthood um, and so beautifully, I think, weaves them together in the way that he sees the world and in his um, environmental activism. I, I just thought it's so beautiful because we, we have this conversation constantly about is it nature, is it nurture that determines personality, right? Mm. Um, and it, it does seem like here we have a beautiful example of both coming together for him to have this beautifully integrated um, view on life. Mm. And that was beautifully put. I picked on exactly the same thing, this notion of science and spirituality or, or let's call it the mind or facts but combined with the heart. Mm. And it's putting those two together that is the sort of essence of any kind of effective action. And I also loved him talking about how sort of friendship and action were together. What is it? Lovely phrase. He said, you know, he's not that interested in, in just kind of meeting people to kind of go to, to go for a beer or something. But he says, around a specific project, I can't wait to hang out with you. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I, I've mentioned this before, uh, Brian Eno's idea of, of, of not genius, but senius. This idea that there's a whole kind of scene where people are looking after each other. There are different people contributing in different ways. And ideas take root and people try them out. And I think that's one of the things I think so excited about the community that's building around outrage and optimism, in fact, is that when work is play for mortal stakes you know that's the thing that i thought that he exemplified so beautifully yeah mm. it's really interesting you say that actually because the, the thing i picked up was when he said it's just a throwaway line at the end he said um it's great to be critical but we no longer have the right to be cynical and i think yes. that really captures yes. where we are in the world and i thought it also was a was a was a comment on him i mean i don't think i've ever met anyone less cynical you know, he was, he, I mean, he was very clear. We need to elect someone else. This president is against science and very clear about what was necessary, but didn't seem remotely cynical about the situation. He was like prepared mm. no, to engage, full all, of optimism, no. full of joy. Amazing person. I also love the part where we engaged him on um, using his platform for, um, for, for big global issues. And I just loved the one line where he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when people come up, you know, I say, Thanks for watching Cheer. And let me introduce you to this marine biologist. Yeah. Right? It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's a great line that I think summarizes what he has done with his platform. Yeah. This amazing platform, you know, celebrity platform that he, yeah, thanks, thanks for watching. And 
here is where Here's I really thing. want you to focus it's your like attention. Jane Fonda, I right? love his, that. His great friend yes. Jane Fonda said, be a repeater. Yeah. yeah. Amplify yeah. the message. And what was it to, that, that Jane Fonda said she was at this event and Joachim Phoenix was there and he just won the Oscar or whatever. And then, you know, he, he, he said, hi, I'm Joachim Phoenix and I'd like to introduce this person who is, you know, the person at the heart of the matter, whether it's, a, you know, a witness or an indigenous person or a, a scientific expert or whoever it was. And it, it's just another dimension to fame. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think it must be very tough uh, for a lot of people who are kind of famous. Um, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting it's easy for them to sort of suddenly be put into a world where kind of everyone recognizes them on the street and all that crazy stuff. Um, but what I, but I, what I would say is that there's... Um, you know, such a latent potential there for people with that platform to make such a significant intervention in everything that needs to be done on climate change and the whole broader sustainability crisis. I'm just waiting for the A-listers now to phone me and I'm, I'm ready to take their call and help I them. Say, I can help them. Paul's absolute lust for world fame and domination was so well disguised in that statement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Thomas, it's, it's good you tell it like that. I, and I mean, an increasing number of A-listers are actually in contact with me. I can't give you any specific names, but <laughs> and some people are just incredibly famous and, and having a fantastic time, spending a lot of time right. with me, um, being kind of cured and helping. Right. <laughs> you helping them. Okay. Yeah, he's available. Well, we help each yeah, other. You yeah. know, it's, it's a big yeah. thing. It's like it's holistic, you know. It's a whole He's available, concept. weddings, bar mitzvahs, whatever you need. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Okay, so we've got a very different and amazing piece of music for you this week um, from London rapper and singer Jelani Blackman, who will perform his song Pretty World. Now, his sound swerves stereotypes. It blends the hard with the soft, the dark with the light. We asked him about his motivation for writing this song, and he said that he had the idea of writing the story of a vulnerable girl. And the more he thought about it, the more he realised that he was describing how he felt we had treated the planet. And digging deeper into the metaphor, he used it to describe how neglect and exploitation has contributed to the state of the world we're in. And he's also deeply thoughtful about the role of the artist. He says the artist's role in climate is to channel their art to contribute to a message. Art is a reflection of society. And the more that art engages with the challenges we face the more people will be confronted with those issues. And the climate emergency is one of the most significant issues we face as a global community. This is Pretty World from Jelani Blackman. It's a different kind of song, but I think it's brilliant. You'll really like it and we'll see you next week. Thanks for being here. Chilling in my living room, green hair, brown skin, just a skinny you. While well, I was 13, when you felt older, eyes move like the oceans, icy blue. You ate my mum's meal like prison food, starving, isolated, little bruised. Didn't know that the cuts run so much deeper, was just foundation on your wounds. And then I saw your face on the news. It was a rape case, now it wasn't true. Tell me that it wasn't true, I'm falling for you. But you ran out the house and put on my shoes. I called out, come back, but you didn't. Couldn't catch up, I felt like a villain. Since then, I've been wondering how you're living. Still just when I find you, that's the mission. Uh, you're beautiful, I let you down. Turn around, turn around. I hope that you can hear me now. You were lost, the one you found. You're beautiful, I let you down. You turn around, turn around. I hope that you can hear me now. You were lost, uh, you don't know how you got here. Just stays in the trap where you're lying on your back, just waiting for a slap, but you're not scared. Thinking back when you used to have long hair. Now it's all coming out from sickness. How come you can never find a witness? Hotel old man boasts of his bigness. Don't even flinch your numb to the inches. Early fingers take your flippers, put one in your mouth, and you choke, and he smiles like citrus. Hunts round your throat, mouth open for the mixtures. He says he's gonna take pictures. You say no, he says he don't like bitches. Just spills and drills and lynches. Pinches your cheeks to face. Faces, eyes, they look tinted, dark, pinned down so hard as I. Uh, you're beautiful, I let you down. You turn around and turn around. I hope that you can hear me now. You were lost the one you found. You're beautiful, I let you down. You turn around and turn around. I hope that you can hear me now. You were lost, I uh, found your lost on the dress. The scumbags wouldn't say where you went. Then I saw your torn dirty dress. Now you're near on a stained mattress. So I knew that you'd be in. At least I was close to your scene. I'd only seen you in my dreams and I'd been bereft. Now I don't know what I'd say. Whether to hold back or caress, you must hate being touched. I'll do whatever is best. I know it's a mess, got so much love. I never felt less. I only felt more. I never forgot sex so fresh. You're beautiful, I let you down. You turn around and turn around. I hope that you can hear me now. You were lost the one you found. You're beautiful, I let you down. You turn around and turn around. I hope that you can hear me now. 
trust the one you found Searching with the rain pouring I saw your form distorting down at anyway And I ran with my heart all in I'm sure I heard you calling Stop walking and ran Just fearing what I might do Who might be coming for you But couldn't miss this chance to lose Was so hard trying to keep track of your moves And the street lights flicker lights Strobes he flew Left, right, left down the roads and soon Saw your face in the light of the moon City fumes far from the place that you started Turn around and face me down Tired of carnage buses Chasing you heartless and marking I stood unarmored hoping Just open You're beautiful, I let you down you Turn around, turn around I hope that you can hear me now You were lost the one you found You're beautiful, I let you down you Turn around, turn around I hope that you can hear me now You were lost the one you found Hey everyone, this is Nolan covering for Clay while he's on holiday. He'll be back next week. Wow, that was a great episode to hear. I'm here in the US and it was a week of frustration and outrage, I have to say. So it was very helpful to hear from Ted Danson this week, to hear about his story, his optimism, and his hope for the future. That track by Jelani Blackman, Pretty World, was amazing. You can check out more about his music by clicking on the show notes. And I would encourage everyone to check him out freestyling on a Fire in the Booth episode on his YouTube channel. It's pretty great. All right, so here's the credits. Outrage and Optimism is a global optimism production and is produced this week by Nolan Rossi. Our executive producer is Marina Mensilahman. Thanks to the entire Global Optimism team, Sarah Law, Katie Bradford, Laura Richardson, Sophie McDonald, Fran Newman, Sarah Thomas, Sharon Johnson, and John Ward. Our hosts are Tom Rivet-Karnick, Christiana Figueres, and Paul Dickinson. Thanks to our guests today, Ted Danson, and to Carolina and Amanda from Ted's team for helping us set that up. Thanks to Tracy Schaefer, and a special thank you to a guest appearance by Tom's cat in this episode. You can find us online at Global Optimism on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Take some time today and rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts, and let us know if there was enough outrage in this episode for you. Clay will be back with you next week. It's been a pleasure filling in. Please subscribe, and we'll see you next week.